The trade war intensifying today with the U.S. and China both imposing 25 percent tariffs on $16 billion worth of goods. This latest round brings the total value of Chinese imports subjected to tariffs to $50 billion, billion and vice versa. And it takes place as both sides are meeting this week, hoping, hoping to hash out a deal. Meanwhile, economists in a Reuters poll and a Moody's report warn that a prolonged trade dispute will hurt economic growth. More on this with Patrick Chovanec with Silvercrest Asset Management, a longtime China watcher, and, a CN and our CNBC contributor, Ron Insana. Gentlemen, welcome. Patrick, do you see any evidence that Mr. Xi is, is backing down at all? I think they're eager to find out what the administration wants. Um, you know, That's it's not clear. clear? Well, it's, it's clear that the administration wants fundamental changes in Chinese behavior, but in terms of actual a concrete, what, what are the concrete deliverables that Chinese needs, China needs to make in order to either delay or lift these tariffs? That's not as clear. And, it's, and one reason it's not clear is because there, I think there's some disagreement within the Trump administration about what the criteria should be. If you remember, you go back two months ago, uh, the last round of negotiations. Afterwards, the Trump administration implied that there was a deal, but that deal evaporated. And reports are that, that, that the reason it evaporated is because there was disagreement within the administration about whether, it was, whether what the Chinese were offering was acceptable or not. Do you see, Ron, the impasse here uh, tracing to the fact that the Chinese don't really understand what we want? I mean, it, it's pretty clear to me, Pat, with all due respect, Patrick, uh, that, that the, what the president really wants is for the trade deficit, the bilateral trade deficit, to shrink one way or another. Well, and the request to have it reduced by $200 billion almost immediately fell on deaf ears in China. And in fact, almost everything that we've asked directly for, the Chinese have refused to accede to. Now, I think the strategic mistake that the United States is not lining up Europe and not lining others who have been affected by intellectual property theft, technology transfers, and things like that, going through the WTO process to take China to task, in which case that would be a more effective way to approach this. And I think most of our trade policies at this point have been a chaotic at best. I mean, you're trying to renegotiate NAFTA without Canada and without the Senate's ex accession, which is going to be required as well. So I think I don't think we have a trade policy per se, either with China or in a broader context. And ironically, today it's China that's going yeah. to WTO and filing a complaint yeah. against us. Yeah. Let's let's talk a little bit, uh, Patrick, if we might, about what a win would look like for both sides if we get to that point where there is some understanding of who wants what. Uh, where is victory declared by the U.S. administration and by uh, Xi in Beijing? Well, the, the Trump administration could take a few small concessions and say, we declare victory. I mean, that's what they did with South Korea over uh, the, the free trade agreement. Um, or they could insist that uh, there's a fundamental readjustment in, in the global economy uh, and rebalancing. However, uh, that's not something that trade sanctions um, and, and what the U.S. is aiming at is really going to solve because that's a function of consumption, investment, and savings in both economies. And so you need a structural approach to that. How does the political realm enter this uh, whole calculus, Ron? I mean, as we, oh. as we get closer and closer to the midterm elections, yeah. uh, you know, does that make the Trump administration more hardened to stick to the big things to declare this a win as opposed to the smaller concessions, which they'll then use as a win I, scenario? I don't know how to answer that except to say that in the, given the events of this week, a win is a win is a win. You would think politically going into the midterms that whatever they could walk away with and say, listen, we just, you know, got China to accede to this or that. In addition to structural forms that Patrick was talking about, I mean, the real solution to this at the end of the day, IP and, and technology transfers is notwithstanding, if you want to cure the trade deficit, you just open the natural gas spigot and you sell a ton of that to China. You sell more food to China. They're our biggest purchaser of, of food products and in terms of agriculture products. And the trade deficit goes away over time, right? I mean, and so that number changes. And, and, and so I, I don't know why the administration wouldn't take that as a victory, that it, because you can't necessarily get every product that you want in alignment so that we produce most of it and we sell most of it. Patrick, these are mid-level talks that are happening yeah. right now. These are not summit level talks. How does the playbook develop now? What, 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 what can we expect out of these talks that gets us to that level where President Trump and President Xi are actually sitting across the table hammering out a deal? So there are two worrying things that I hear from the Trump administration right now that I think 
uh, might put us on a path to greater conflict and, and not a resolution. The first is that uh, the Trump administration keeps on saying that the Chinese are going to run out of bullets, that because they, because we import more from China than they do from us, that China is going to run out of things to put tariffs on and therefore they're not going to be able to retaliate. I mean, that strikes me as playing checkers when really the game is chess. Um, the second thing is that they keep on implying recently that the Chinese economy is tottering and really just if the U.S. gives it a kick that the Chinese will be down on their knees and begging for mercy. Um, I have been talking for years about the problems in China's economy. They're serious. Uh, but I think this really oversimplifies and misunderstands the dynamics of those well, problems. that would also cut off the nose to spite the face. So yes, to speak. And, and, I mean and, that would be that would well, be terrible for the U.S. and for the U.S. stock market if if we were to actually proverbial kick out that and third stool and way. have China's economy wobble. Right, right, or crash, and, or crash. Or, 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 yeah. yeah, I mean their stock market has come down dramatically, and, and and as we've read and as we've heard, the president seems to be playing this card. Our stock market's up, our economy's strong. We've got them where we want them, so we're going to punch them even harder. From a global trade perspective, that is not a winning hand, and it would come back to haunt the U.S. economy down the road. I, I also think it's, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of, of the vulnerabilities in the Chinese economy and what they mean also mm -hmm. for the global economy. Yeah, they have $3 right. trillion um, dollars you know, in it, 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 it strikes me as similar to, you, you want to, I'm not saying that you can't put pressure on China, and I'm not saying that there aren't smart ways to do it. Um, but you need to be prepared with a realistic idea about what the results will be and what the response is going to be. And this strikes me as you know, the, the economic equivalent of saying that we're going to be welcomed with confetti when we march into Baghdad and you know, problem solved. And, and, and that kind of fairy tale leads to On that vivid note.